the morning. church and this week folks this week we have people here and have people there but then again Lord's people are everywhere right? amen 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 so wherever you are whether you're here or whether you're there we are going to worship the Lord Jesus Christ in spirit and truth amen amen now, I got people here today amen amen uh, Jeremy I didn't hear you amen amen, amen. Right, there we go. everybody stand we're going to at least stand here I hope you're going to stand there as well because People, in Jesus Christ, we thrive. Without him, not so much. But with Jesus Christ, we thrive. Amen? Amen. So sing with us.
Christ alone we thrive. And Lord, thank you so much for salvation, which is by faith alone, by grace alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Lord, this day we are here because of you. Some of us here, some of us out still in cyberspace, but Lord, all of us, let us focus our hearts and our minds on you. Let us worship you in spirit and in truth wholeheartedly, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please have a seat. Wow, this is exciting. Amen. This yes. is exciting. Amen. You got, no. Amen. Amen. Woo, man, this is exciting. It is good to see those of you that are here. It's good to see those of you that watch or watching online. It is a joy to, to look out and actually see people. You know, not that I, I have not enjoyed the six or seven of us that have been here for the past two months, I have. But it is a joy to see all of you. Hey, how are y'all doing there in the middle? Good to see y'all. Haven't seen you in a while. Hope you're doing well. Um, just to get right to it, we're just going to go straight to a scripture reading this morning that I believe has everything to do with today. Uh, uh, it has everything to do with the message today. Uh, a, a pastor friend of mine in, in uh, Paris, Texas, uh, they're calling their gathering together today, Reassemble. So I've kind of stolen that, and I'm using that. I'm throwing it out there, but welcome to the reassembling. Uh, open up your Bibles for our scripture reading this morning to the 133rd Psalm. Psalm 133, hear the word of God. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, for folks here, please stand and sing with us, and at home, if you want to stand, you can sing better, actually. Look it up. We're going to do an older hymn. We haven't done it for a long time, so sing out with us. I will sing in deep and sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, singing to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love.
That'll preach.
tithes and offerings, and we also have a musical special that's going on today. Amen.
Wow, it's, it's almost like the first time I ever preached again, <laughs> having people. It's great. Amen. Um, don't know where to start, so I'll just start. Hold on. Big bold letters. Hold on. I've been saying that for a while. Hold on. For so many different reasons. Um, go ahead and open your Bibles. Just go ahead and go to Hebrews chapter 10. I'll tell you what verse to hit here in a minute, and I'll get us there. Hebrews chapter 10 is where we'll be at this morning. Now, I'm not sure, and even though I look old enough, I wasn't there, but I think the most difficult of all messages that Jesus ever gave his disciples was the one that he gave just before his arrest. But that night of his arrest, when he was arrested, when he was betrayed by a friend, a brother, and he gave a very difficult message that night. Uh, because just to write after the fall of that was a false trial and a crucifixion. And I think it was difficult for them because... This was different than Jesus had taught before. He, he had led to this idea that he was going to go away. He led to this idea, if you read the Gospels, he, he's letting them know ahead of time this is coming, but they had probably become very comfortable in the presence of the Master. They had been with him for over three years, day in and day out, and they were comfortable because, well, he was the teacher, the leader, the Master. He was... He taught them. He performed miracles. Uh, nowhere in the scripture does it say they ever went without anything. In fact, we, we read where he made the loaves and fishes to feed 5,000 and then again 4,000. So if you were in the presence of the living God incarnate here on earth, you wanted for nothing. And so that, that they had become comfortable. And I think maybe, just like anybody else in the world, they had become accustomed to a certain way. And I think that's where we get, even today, we get accustomed to certain things. We get comfortable in a certain way of life. And oftentimes we take things for granted. We just assume that certain people and certain places and certain things will always be there and then all of a sudden it's not. It's just gone. I mean, we just, it, it'll be there tomorrow. The Bible tells us not to boast about tomorrow. Not to worry about tomorrow. We only hang out today, but we get accustomed and think things are always going to be there and they're not. So in this message that Jesus had given his disciples, what he would boil down to was, you know, the paraphrase was that all of this, the time you had with me here on the earth, it's about to change. I'm going to leave and everything is going to be different from now on. Nobody likes hearing that. Nobody likes hearing that everything's going to be different from now on. In fact, what he told them was in this message was that their group, their particular group, these disciples were about to be broken up. They were going to be on the run, and they were going to be persecuted. He told them, you're going to get dragged up before magistrates. Yet, at the end of that message, just before he went and prayed and spent time with the Heavenly Father, he gave them comfort and he gave them a promise. And it's in John 16, 33 that says this. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that truth, that comfort that Jesus gave his disciples, that promise is still just as true and valid today as it was for them all that time ago. Still true, still valid. Because number one, there is peace in Christ. Amen. Yep. Number two, there will be trouble in this life. Third, Jesus...
Jesus, our Lord and Savior, has overcome, has prevailed, has conquered, is victorious over the world and all its problems. So we are to be of good cheer, have courage, have comfort. Amen? Amen. Because in Jesus is peace. In Jesus is life everlasting. In Jesus to come shall be no more tears, no more death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. Amen. Now as of late, in our sphere of influence, in our realm, however, as Jesus said, there has been trouble. Everybody's had some form of trouble, and trouble's all... Uh, uh, relative to who you are and how heavy your wagon is to pull and what you have to deal with. But some of the trouble that we've had to deal with is some folks have gotten sick. Some folks have lost family members. Some folks have lost their jobs and their source of income. Some people have been separated for, from loved ones for weeks and weeks on end. Many people's routines, the things that they're accustomed to, the things they're comfortable with, their way of life, their plans, their desires have all been put on hold or even yet been completely just blown out of the water. Just gone. That's not going to happen now. But be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I'll give, you, I'll give you an Old Testament example. I'll, I'll use an example out of the Bible about being of good cheer. If you read the Old Testament, you will see, especially if you go through Judges and you're starting to get in on kings, you're going to start to find out Israel did what was right in their own eyes because there was no king. And Israel kept doing what was right in their own eyes, and then they kept getting put in captivity. They kept getting in trouble. They kept separating themselves from what God wanted. But even in that time when Israel was in captivity, not for the last time, there would be another time, but when they were in captivity prior to the, to the, to the Roman Empire, the Persians had still to come, I believe, but... Nebuchadnezzar, wicked Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, had rule over Israel. They were in captivity. And the Lord tells his people this in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, to give you an expected end. Some people's uh, Bibles that translates out to, uh, to prosper you. And they use that in the wrong context. It's not what that means. Expected in means that, in other words, it means that people of God, people of God, listen, people of God who know Him, who, who know Him personally, have a future hope. One that is more desirable and one that is victorious over the trouble and change in this life. Amen. Which is why in this time, in this day and age, right now, in this place, relative to these people right here, in these issues in this world, what we need is to draw close to God. What we need is His way in our life. What we need is more of His Word. And we need, need, need fellowship. Amen. Amen. We need that fellowship. Not only does God desire it of us, He requires it of us. Yeah. In that passage in Hebrews I told you to turn to, we're going to look at verses 19 through 25, but the context of this passage here in the middle of Hebrews, the writer has previously stated in, in earlier chapters that Christ is unchangeable and eternal. Amen? Amen. 
He has stated that no human deed, no human work compares to that of the sacrifice of Christ. Amen? Amen. And our sin, and this is a big one, our sins are remembered no more. Verse 17 in that chapter says, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Amen. Amen. Past, present, and future, sins are gone. It's like the, the psalmist said in Psalm 103 and 12. He said, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. Amen. All glory be to God. Amen. Hear what the word of God says here. Verses 19 through 25. Having therefore, brethren... Boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Four points this morning. Number one, let us draw near to God. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. Let us draw near to God. There was a, a time when drawing close to God the way that we have now was nigh on impossible because grace had not been given yet by the blood of the perfect Lamb, by our, our sweet and precious Jesus, our Lord and Savior, had yet to come. So drawing close to God, having this relationship that we have with Him through salvation wasn't there yet. In the Old Covenant, there was a, a holy place. There was, there was the tabernacle that went around with them in the wilderness, and then there was the temple. And they were both set up the same way. And in that place, there was places where certain people could go and couldn't go, but there was a holy place where God was. And He would be there, and He would show up there. And not anybody could get in there. There was... A barrier. And that barrier was a curtain. It was a veil between man and God. Only priests could go in there. And they had to be, they, boy, they had to do some special stuff before they could even get in there. And they would tie a rope around them because if they did something wrong, they were dead and had to be dragged back out of that holy place. That's right. That was then. That curtain, that barrier, some have, as I've studied it, and I believe it to be true myself now, that that curtain is a symbol of Christ's body. Because on that day, when he died on the cross for the, for the sins of mankind, that curtain was ripped into, just torn. And what that did, that was, that was the, 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 the way that it allowed us to go into the presence of God, to come boldly before the throne of grace. His, his death gave us access, the believer, direct access to God. Amen and thank God. So, draw near to God. But, there's always a caveat when you read the scripture. Please read the scripture in context. Don't just take one verse. Some of them you can, but please, it says, draw near to God with a what? True heart in full assurance. Know that you know when you draw near to God. This means that you cannot 
You cannot just give it lip service. You cannot give the Lord lip service. You can't just say it. You have to believe it. You have to believe it. And it's not any work on your part. It's just you've accepted and you know that you know. You can't give it lip service. It reminds me so much, and I don't mean to disparage anybody or step on toes, but it reminds me so much of what I've talked about the Sunday after Easter. About how many people flood the churches on Easter and Christmas. And then right after Easter, where are they? They're not here. They haven't read this. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. They're not, they're not here. You have to believe it. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 15, 8, he said, The people, this people draws nigh unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And he's actually quoting Isaiah. And as Isaiah was one of the prophets who was telling the people in captivity that very thing. Oh, you worship me with your mouth, but not with your heart. Far too many times throughout history, even now in the church, in the body of Christ, in the universal body of Christ, many will come to church and they'll make a profession of faith, but it's only with their mouth. It's only with their mouth. Because down deep in their heart, there's a serious problem. They've, they've spoken the words, and the only thing I can figure is, because I, I can't judge a person's heart, but they've spoken the words, but maybe they just did it to fit in. I want to fit in. I want to be part of this crowd. Maybe they did it to make someone happy because someone kept saying, you need to go, you need to go, you need to go. Mm -hmm. Maybe they did it to gain acceptance of other people. And maybe they did it to gain acceptance of other people in certain entities. It looks good for me to claim Christianity. You'll know them by their fruits. The Bible says you'll know people by their fruits. The fact is, we have to believe with our, with our heart. It must be true. Paul tells us in Romans, in the 10th chapter, Romans 9 and 10, he says, yeah, he says, confess with your mouth, but also it says believe in your heart. You, you can believe in your heart. You may not be able to speak for, for some physical reason. But if you believe in your heart, that's the key. Because you know that you know. You've, you've accepted that grace. But the problem is you can use your mouth and not mean it. And it's like somebody telling somebody, I'm sorry. I used to tell my mom, I'm sorry. She goes, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. Are you really? This is not an act of good deeds. It is not of works. This is, a, this is accepting faith by knowing that you know our conscience is clear. Our sin is washed away by the work that Christ did on the cross. Amen. And knowing this makes us, should compel us, to be constantly and obsessively wanting to draw near to God... The one who loves us the most, draw close to God, and he shall draw close to you. That's a heart that knows. Second point, God desires and requires to hold fast to our hope. I know your Bible says profession of faith, but hold fast to our hope. Hope. The word faith here in this verse translates out to hope, expectation, confidence. Do you have confidence in the Lord? I pray so. It's not religion. 
It's hope. It's hope. It's the hope we have in Jesus. Those who originally read this letter when it was written, those that it was written to, they were tempted. They were extremely tempted to falling back into that old covenant where there were, there were works and there were deeds and there were laws. I, I can't fathom that. I can't fathom having a, a, a faith that requires my deeds. I can't do it. I can't get to God on my own. I don't, we don't even seek God. He seeks us. And we accept it when we know it. But they would. They were tempted to fall back into this, into this law mentality. So the encouragement here is, is not to rely on what we can do or rules that we follow because our security is in Jesus Christ, not ourselves. It's not what we can do. It is what he has done. Christ saves us from sin. Christ sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for when we do sin. If you say you have no sin, you are a liar. Boy, nobody likes that passage, but I'll preach it. Because I know that I, I cannot say that I know I have sinned. If I ever say that I don't have sin... It's a horrible joke, and I probably ought to start running from the lightning to come. <laughs> Amen. We hold on to his truth, as the scripture says, without wavering. We just hold on to his truth without wavering. We don't listen to the voices of the world and return to wickedness. We don't listen to false teaching, but we do trust that Christ died for us. We do trust that Christ rose from the dead for us. No trials, no temptation, no circumstances should be able to shape our faith in Jesus Christ. What we do is we take joy in the truth of Christ's return. And we do take joy in seeking that city to come. In Hebrews in the 13th chapter, 14th verse. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We live in a, if you haven't figured it out, we live in a crazy world. Amen. <laughs> Man, somebody ought to sell tickets. Yep. <laughs> somebody ought to sell tickets to this show. But it's not our home. Amen. We're just we're visiting. Praise God. Get that, man. Get that in your heart today. We're just visiting here. We got a job to do while we're here. We work in God's kingdom, but we're just visiting because our plans have been blown up. So what? So what? I, you know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I know some people are upset. I got friends all over the United States who are so upset. So what? Do you trust God? Or do you trust your plans? Because we know that we know God is faithful and will not break his promises. God's promises are greater and better than any plans we could ever come up with. Amen. Amen. Third point this morning. God desires and requires to stir up, stir others, stir others up to love, to good works, provoke People to love, to do. I love that word provoke. I want to provoke you to love. That just doesn't sound like it makes sense. He's provoking me. <laughs> you can be provoked in many ways. But to be provoked to love. Stirred up to love, encouraged to love, and provoked to good works. Yep. You know, I'm not a competitive person. I, I really don't care much for competition, but sometimes people try to provoke me to do more than I do. That's a hard thing. 
Yeah, good for you, wife. <laughs> <laughs> she does provoke me in good ways. But, you know, a huge part of a, of a person, a follower of Jesus Christ, is to be is to, to wholeheartedly encourage each other to love and to do good things. Amen. We should do good things. Amen. We should do good things. We should always be looking for ways to, to build each other up, reminding each other of what real godly love looks like and showing each other what it looks like. Too much of the world has this, this fallen, broken, twisted method of tearing people down. You know, it's one thing to... You know, I used to like to go years ago, it was a long time ago, man, when I think about it, go to comedy clubs and watch people tell jokes. Because I like to laugh. Man, I like to laugh. I look for things to make me laugh. Sometimes I laugh at things that I probably ought not laugh at. But humor, when it's, when it's self-deprecating, is, can be funny. But a lot of the humor that we have in this world is built on uh, making ourselves and others look really bad. It's, 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 there's, there's truth in humor. It's like, I'm, I'm going to point out your failures. We're going to laugh at it. And some people tolerate that. Well, we're, we're just laughing with you. No, you're not. You're laughing at me. You're not helping me. You're not building me up. You're calling me less than. Calling them less than. Calling myself less than. Humor is really built on pointing out failures. I noticed that years ago, watching being a kid that grew up in front of a TV set, I started noticing it in television shows when they when they quit being just situations and became shows about how I can uh, to burn you more than the other person, how I can I can disagree with you so badly and just make you out to be an idiot as much as possible. That hasn't gone away. That still seems to be the, the focus of entertainment. That's not entertaining. Listen, uh, loving correction in this world is often needed, but I said loving correction. We must always speak the truth in love. And when hard truths are needed, it is best to build up and not tear down. I know it's been said, sometimes, sometimes you've got to break some eggs to make an omelet. But destroying things doesn't build them up. We care for one another. We have concern for one another. We pray for one another. We strengthen one another. We build each other up. And, and listen, our good work, those, those good things that we provoke each other to do, that's not what gets us into heaven, but it does show the world to whom we belong. And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus commanded us, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that passage the other day. I was thinking about that passage the other day as I was walking around the neighborhood and praying and, and, I, and, and, I, just, and I was asking God to show me His glory, show me something Father, just just to, to to take glory to watch you to see you at work, and that's when it struck me that God's glory is my joy, our joy. God's glory is our joy. Delight yourself in the Lord; He'll give you the desires of your heart. God's glory is our joy. Amen. Look for those things. Mm. Build up. And fourth point this morning, God desires and requires, here it comes. This is a toe stepping, mashing steel toe, stepping on your, your foot in loving correction. God desires and requires church attendance. Amen. 
He requires it, demands it. We are cannot, must not neglect worship together. If all possible, we must worship together. Because we come together for worship as a, as a body. When the Holy Spirit is present, worshiping and glorifying God. We come together for that purpose. He requires it. We come together for prayer. To pray for each other and to lay our prayers out with thanksgiving. Our supplications and prayers with thanksgiving to God as a group. He requires it. To, to study and learn the word better because he requires it. For ministry and witnessing to each other and others, all about all glory to God because He requires it. Amen. Even way back when, when this letter was written, it was it's pointed out in some uh, commentary and histories that there were those who began to. This is why the letter was written uh, uh, as some is the manner of some is. They were, they were starting to, to fall out. They stopped gathering together for worship. They stopped gathering together for fellowship. And I, I suppose it's just like any other. People don't, listen, people don't change. Culture changes, but the hearts of men and women do not change. It's the nature of sin. It's, it's the brokenness. So they have the same problem that happens today. People started to, to stop coming because people have this idea that they can worship God in some other way than what he requires. There are many ways to worship God. It is true. You can, in fact, and you should worship him while you're taking a walk in nature and looking at the trees and the flowers in the spring. Right now is a great time to take a walk. If you just walk through our neighborhood, I don't know where it is, anywhere else, but I look around and all the, the big pink blooms and the white blooms and, and the trees are coming out and the grass is green and it has to be mowed six times a week. But, you know, it's beautiful and it's God's glory. God is saying, look at what I've done for you to look at. And just remember, it's about me. God's glory. And we get, to, we get to enjoy that at night. We can look up at the stars in the sky and go, that is just beautiful. And he hung all those there for a purpose, for his glory. But we get to enjoy that. Yeah, we can do that taking a walk. We can, we can worship God in personal devotion time. You need personal devotion time. You probably need way more of it than you think you do because I know I need way more of it than I think I do. I need to get up early and spend more time with the Lord and spend more time in devotion. Devotion means, uh, devotion time doesn't mean reading a nice scripture and me being fulfilled by it, me being comforted by it. Devotion time me, means me devoting my time to God for His purposes so that He can teach me. Amen. So He can teach me. Yes, he comforts me. Yes, he's there for me, but that devotion is not devoted to me. It's devoted to him. Yes, you can. You can, and I've heard this before. I can worship God on Sunday out in my boat fishing. This came from a man who uh, decided at one point in his life, after being ordained a minister of the gospel, decided that the Bible was not true after leading people to Christ for so many years, decided that the scripture was incorrect, that it was written by men. He still believed in God, but he could do it from his boat fishing and didn't need to go to church anymore. Someone who was ordained to preach God's word fell out. We are commanded not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. See, I guess that guy read all of the Bible, but got to that point and just, maybe it was blacked out. Maybe the page was missing. 
assembling of ourselves together. And this is where it's going to get hard because I got all over my notes. <laughs> I was writing notes before. Man, the Lord works on me so hard. Um, we need we need fellowship. Amen. I, I I don't know about you, but I am on fire this morning because there's people here. Yeah. I'm encouraged. Amen. Woo! Man, I'm encouraged. <laughs> yeah, buddy. And I need that encouragement. We need that encouragement. We need the, the love of other believers. Yep. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us about gifts that God gives to us and that we come together and encourage each other in these gifts and, and try to build each other up in these gifts. Uh, and, you know, and, and we do that. Listen, we spent some time apart. And, and we're still doing that a little bit. And that's okay because of certain circumstances. And it was because of health and safety reasons. And I, to this day, believe it's, it's the right thing to do. I do have my opinions, but this ain't the place for it. <laughs> and I can't do that. I, I'm your pastor. My, my, my goal, my job, my desire is to do what God would have me do. And that is to teach you what this says. So I'm going to keep all that to myself as best as possible. <laughs> we had to stay apart for a while. It was the right thing to do. However, while, during this time when we were apart, did we learn anything? We should have been learning how important the assembling of ourselves together is. I know, I'm not, I'm not going that road, but I know, not here, but in other places, there's still trouble about the church assembly. God help them. God help them say, no, enough's enough. Obey God and not man. Amen. We should have learned in that time how much it's how much pain it is to be apart. Yeah, we worshiped online together and that works, and we can do that, but it's painful to be apart. I'm kind of, you know, somebody said I'm an extrovert. What they don't know is I'm kind of a mix of both. I really like being alone. But I miss you. It was painful. We should have learned that. You see, just recently while I was talking to Iron Sharpens Iron. That's another reason. Iron Sharpens Iron. I was talking to a good good friend and brother, colleague of mine, and it was noted that this thing that we had here is just exactly what the enemy wants. The enemy, we used a different term. We said they, but it's the enemy. It's the enemy that wants us to be separated, wants us to be out of fellowship, out of the will of God, trusting in something other than God. And I'll be very careful here. Trusting in the science and not God. Well, that, see, now that's a broad brush stroke. I hope you understand that. You may be thinking, oh, I don't know what he's talking about. No, it's a broad, it's a, I am, but I'm not. It's a broad brush stroke. It's trusting in something other than God. It's, it's trusting in the science and not God. And let me say this with all belief in my heart, with all biblical truth, that if the, the science does not line up with God's word, then the science is wrong. Amen. And there's a reason for this. Let me give you, I'll give you an example off the chart you're probably not thinking about. This could cause all kinds of debate, but I'm not going to debate it. Some people, even my theologian brothers, some of them, believe, please, please don't chuckle or boo me, that the earth, the world as we know it, is 450 billion years old. 450 billion years old. Okay, that's based on science. Numbers from machines that date things. That have been programmed by God? No, programmed by men. Amen. Those are men's programs. 
Now, there's other people like myself. Now I'm going to put myself in that category of a closed-minded, Bible-thumping, Baptist fundamentalist. <laughs> and I don't care if it hurts, Pope. <laughs> I believe that the earth is somewhere between six and 7,000 years old. Amen. Yes! Woo! He said it out loud. That's why I stand on it. Anybody watching? You can comment all you want. I'm not going to comment back. I don't do that. I'll let the Holy Spirit deal with you. <laughs> I believe the earth is six to 7,000 years old because when you go to, to Luke, and you look at the lineage from Christ. Christ was about 2,000 years ago, a little more. And you look at the lineage from Christ. It goes all the way back to Adam. There's no breaks in there. And just prior to Adam, God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. In the Hebrew, when you look it up, the yom is the word for day, which means a 24-hour period. And that's when it started. So where we live now is only about six or 7,000 years. Take a, take a few hundred here or there. That's the lineage. That's what Scripture says. And, and here's one. You might say, well, you, you're wrong about that. That's just an allegory. What if, what if God gave me the math to figure out that it's, that it's 450 billion years old or million years old? Well, check your math. God does not contradict himself. Amen. Amen? Amen. Science lesson for the day. God doesn't contradict himself. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, the Bible says. Man's math. Yeah, look, I know the two and two equal four. Every time. I, you know, I know that diseases can transmit and people can get sick. I've seen it. I know it to be true. But I cannot always trust their man if it don't line up with what God says. And the reason that we have to be aware of these things and hang on and hold on is because of what this says here about the assembling of ourselves together, exhorting one another as so much the more, as it says, as you see the day approaching. The day is approaching. What does that mean, Pastor? Let me tell you what it means. All of the theologians from the early church fathers on have all agreed the day approaching is the return of our Lord and Savior. And he said it way back then, as you see the day approaching. Listen, we don't know when that return is. We don't know the, the year. We don't know the day. And we don't know the hour. But we obey God's command up until that point to assemble. We know it's coming. We ought to be able to see the writing on the wall. Jesus himself said war and rumor of war and pestilence and famine. He was talking about viruses. He was talking about earthquakes in diverse places. That was happening then. It's been happening since then. The day and the hour, don't know. Only the Father in heaven knows. But we ought to be able to see the writing on the wall even now so because we, we, got, we got this thing where we got said you need to separate One of the things that ought to clue us in, again, I still got on those steel toed boots. I'll get them off here in a minute. But listen, it's called a falling away. The Bible specifically talks about it in 2 Thessalonians, the falling away. That is the writing on the wall for us here in the church. We've all seen it, we've seen glimpses of it. People. People come to church, and then all of a the sudden, they're gone. They just quit coming. They stop assembling. And all I can figure is, they got uncomfortable. Because some loudmouth, fundamental, Bible-believing, Baptist preacher preached every word. 
Jesus said if the son would go because the word offended him. Maybe, uh, maybe they all of a sudden were gone because they just didn't believe to begin with. That in itself is sad. But know this, the day is coming. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. But until that day, until that day, hold on. Hold on. Hold fast the profession of faith. Draw near to God with a true heart. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as we see the day approaching. Hold on. And do it with joy. Don't do it out of duty. Don't, don't do it out of fear. Hold on in joy and draw near to God. Draw near to God. Hold fast to hope. Encourage each other. Build each other up. Worship together. Even in times of trouble and despair. Especially in time of trouble. Why? Our joy is God's glory. It is for the glory of God. God desires it and he requires it. And no one and no thing should ever stand in the way of us assembling and worshiping together. Amen? Amen. 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 That being said, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you've only, I'll just give you the opportunity, if you've only given it lip service, today would be a good day to believe in your heart. The Bible says, whosoever believes in the Lord, whosoever calls on the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever calls on the Lord shall be saved. That invitation is open to anyone. All sins forgiven, past, present, and future. Direct access, that torn veil, to God. To have peace in times of trouble. For this light of affliction is nothing compared in that glory that is to come. Things change. The world changes. We do stuff different, but we never stop worshiping God and doing what He has called us to do. If you are having trouble doing that, maybe it's a heart issue. You spoke it, but you didn't mean it. You were trying to impress somebody. Maybe you've never spoken. Maybe you've never been asked. I, I'm amazed at how many people have never been asked if they know Christ as their sin. And I'm asking you today, do you know Jesus is your Savior? If you don't, just pray with me this prayer. God, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know I'm a sinner. There's no doubt that I have thoughts in my mind that are wrong. There's no doubt that I've done things that offend you to separate me from you. And Lord, I want that free gift of salvation. I accept it. I'm asking right now for Jesus. Jesus, please be the Lord of my life. I want to be led, guided, and directed by the Holy Spirit. I want to know that peace that passes all understanding, even in times of trouble. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, I, I ask this in prayer. If you prayed that prayer, if you prayed that prayer right now, first time ever, you come forward. You come forward. Confess it with your mouth, but believe it in your heart. If you believe it in your heart, nothing's going to stop you from naming the name of Christ. If you believe in your heart, nothing's going to stop you from worshiping God and assembling together and worshiping Him in all ways possible. If 
you made that profession of faith in your heart today, if you accepted salvation, you either come forward or let us know, and we will rejoice with the angels in heaven. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and sing our last song.
I hope to see you again Wednesday night. We'll be we'll have Bible study here. We're still going to do it live. And uh, we'll be back again next Sunday. We're still going to be doing that live. We're going to do as much as we can to reach people for the cause of Christ. I appreciate all of you that were watching online and worshiping online. Remember, you can you can go to our website to download documents or to give online. Uh, all those things that are included in worship, the assembling together, if you still need to assemble out there, that's okay. You know what? That's fine. But I'll be glad when you get back in the swing of things and get back here with us all together. Amen? Amen. So let me uh, pray for you and we shall be dismissed. Gracious Heavenly Father, what a glorious day it is uh, to be your child. Father God, to be saved, to have, to have that great salvation, to be able to, to lay out everything before you, God, all of our concerns and all of our praises and all of the blessings you pour out on us, Father, are too memorable to count. We just, we just ask, Lord, that we remember that. As we, as we leave this place, as we go about the rest of our business, we pray, God, that, that you put people in our paths that need to know Jesus. Give us the words to speak, Father God. Give us the boldness and the strength to speak out the, the truth of your love. We thank you, Father. We wouldn't dare but pray any of this other than Jesus' holy name. Amen.